it was, it's great today because a lot of people have been talking about accounting. Um, and it's something that we take for granted. I actually think I heard someone make a, a joke about accountants at dinner last night. Um, accounting isn't very sexy. Um, and remarkably, during this massive and very long financial crisis, we haven't heard a lot about it. Um, the graph that I have up here uh, is from uh, uh, 2011, when there was an argument about uh, U.S. debt, and there, the United States uh, 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 was downgraded, and the U.S. Treasury claimed that there was a $2 trillion error. And I was like, wow, that's a really big error. And at that moment, I was actually studying uh, French and English uh, economic crisis during the American War of Independence. And what I had found, and what I'm going to show to you today, is the sort of first moment where people talk about finance and accounting in public. It's something that we expect to talk about. It's something that today, for example, a good president uh, 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 might be seen as someone who balances the budget or not, doesn't balance the budget. We associate these numbers of accounting, which is really what they are, with political virtue. And the same thing goes for companies and balance sheets, right? You want to see uh, a profit. You don't want to see a loss. And those are just basic terms of accounting. Well, when this happened, uh, I was studying what I'm about to show you, and I expected there to be a flurry of arguments about the calculations. I said, if someone makes a $2 trillion error, I want to know how they do it. And they vaguely discussed it. Bloomberg had a very short article on it. There were no numbers. There were no calculations. No one asked to see the books of the S&P, of the United States. I was really, really shocked. And so what I did was I said, you know, I want to find the moment when we first start talking about accounting in public. Again, whether it be a company that says, we're successful, trust us, invest in us, uh, uh, because here are our numbers, they're great. But also, and I think in some ways more importantly, when states, when political entities stop being simply monarchs or leaders and really started being connected with the numbers of accounting. And in fact, that shows how important accounting is, that we really get to a point in the modern age when you can define a country by how well its accounts uh, are kept and, and how well they're presented. So I started to look for this moment. I wanted to find the first time. I looked in Italy uh, during the Renaissance, um, and accounting was everywhere. It was considered essential. It was part of basic curriculum. Um, but they kind of messed that up. They, they didn't keep their accounting as well as they should have, considering they invented double entry accounting, which uh, I think, as most people know here, means that if you sell a cow, um, you get credit for the three florins that you sell the cow for, but you, take, you write down a loss in the other column for the cow itself. And those two things cross each other out. And at the bottom of each column, the numbers should add up. That's what double entry is. Um, so essentially, I start looking for this moment. And I look in the obvious places. I go to Switzerland. I go to Lausanne. Um, the Swiss drink a lot of wine, drink a lot of white wine. With the Swiss, we go through their archives, Geneva. Um, the Swiss are really secretive about their accounting. They do it really well. But in fact, when people try and publicize the numbers, they kill them. Okay, they actually execute them. I'm like, okay, this isn't the first moment that people talk about accounting and politics. I go to Holland. Um, the Dutch don't agree about anything, uh, uh, which makes them uh, interesting to work with scientifically because it's hard to get anyone to sort of agree on, on, on anything. But we know that the Dutch really use accounting. They use it well. And we know that the entire Dutch elite learns double entry when they learn Latin. You've got this incredibly educated elite. They all can keep books, even Spinoza, went to accounting school, but when one of, his, one of the boats from his father's firm, his father had died, didn't come back, he had to write such a massive loss in his account books, he had a ner near nervous breakdown, and he decides to do philosophy and invents modern atheism. So, you know, accounting can have really profound effects on people. Um, and, you know, I don't, the Spinoza choice is, a, is, I understand his choice. It's a weird one, but, but it, it, it's, it's a big choice. So, so I keep looking, and I look in England, and I find an argument about accounting. Um, it's, in this, it's, it's, it's during the first bubble, um, during the South Sea bubble, there's an argument about uh, tax receipts, and it happens. But only two pamphlets are published. Nobody cares. 
I'm like, how can nobody care about this? This is a big deal. These are the three economic centers of Europe, and no one's talking about accounting in public. Now, I grew up in France, so I went back to the French libraries, and I just start flipping through things. Now, France is a funny place. This is a Swiss person who worked in France. Um, but France is a funny place, because in the 18th century in France, the French were really behind economically. They didn't have a national bank. They, didn't, they hadn't really put together a functional paper currency. Um, they had the worst tax system that I've ever seen in the early modern period outside of Spain. Um, financially, this was a very backwards country, all right? However, it was the center of communication in Europe. It was where they were developing the encyclopedia. It was where um, the pamphlet trade was taking off. It was where printers knew how to do illegal printing. It was where philosophers congregated to come hang out with people like Voltaire. It was where Voltaire came to explain to the world what Newton was actually doing, all right? So this was, I'm trying to think of an analogy for a place where people study communication and information uh, uh, and they network. Um, Anyway, it'll come to me. It'll come to me. But in any case, it reminds me of, 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 of a place. So I start studying finance during this period. And there's a famous document from this period. Um, it's called the Compte Rendu au Roi. And it is considered one of the best sellers of all time. This means accounts rendered to the king. And it's a well-known work. And so I said, you know, this is an interesting work because look at it. It's, it's, it's a balance sheet. I said, boy, you know, it's funny. I, I, I never sort of realized that one of the greatest bestsellers of all time was a balance sheet. I said, maybe there's something to it. So I start digging. Now, this guy, Necker, is an interesting guy. He's Swiss, and he's brought in because Louis XVI has about $3.5 trillion of debt. He pays about 200 million, oh, sorry, did I say dollars? Livre, let's just say pounds. 3 trillion, 3.5 trillion pounds in national debt to pay for the American War of Independence, okay? So you, you know, forget your freedom fries. Eat your French fries because they paid for this war and it cost a lot of money. Now, um, the king had revenues of around 500 million pounds a year. He paid 6% on his direct debts to the Swiss, but he had to pay out annuities um, he had to pay out um, uh, uh, government bonds, which were often up to 60%. Essentially, the French could not pay their debts. England, at the same time, let's say in, in, in 17, let's see in, in the 1770s, as the American War really picks up, England is a country a third the size of France. It has a booming economy. It has a much better tax collection system. The French can't collect taxes from their elite. This, I know this one is crazy, okay? <laughs> but the nobles, very small group, between 1% and 3%, and they're not allowed to be taxed. It's called privilege because they're supposed to defend the king. That goes back to the Middle Ages. They can't be taxed. They have more than 50% of the wealth. Again, <laughs> I mean, you know, never could this happen in a rational universe, right? So they can't be taxed. So, but England... England, they can actually tax a lot of their gentry. They don't have the same noble system. Not only do they have a better tax system, they have a national bank. They're borrowing at 3%. So these guys both have these massive public debts, all right? Um, but the French can't pay theirs back. They don't have a system to do it. So Necker comes in. He's Swiss and he's Protestant. And in France, that doesn't make you the most popular person at a dinner party, okay? It depends, it depends. I know a lot of wonderful Swiss Protestant people that I like to have dinner with, but back then there were certain prejudices against them. Why is Necker coming in? He had been head of the East India Company. He also could raise money from his friends in Switzerland and just keep taking out more debt. But he also does something else. He comes in to do financial reform. He tries to collect taxes which aren't being collected. The tax collectors have lifetime jobs, they basically keep the money, they don't keep books. So what Necker says is, look, every tax collector has to learn how to do double-entry bookkeeping. Now, double-entry bookkeeping, 
was used both by business people and municipalities since, let's say, 1300, widely used. And yet, again and again and again, people don't use it. And in France, where there had been numerous Florentine merchants floating around Bruges and Lyon, I mean, that's in Belgium, sorry, um, uh, but in this area, uh, there have been, double entry was well known, and yet no tax collectors kept double entry books. So he said, look, I want everyone to keep double entry books so that I can audit the tax collectors. Well, obviously this made everyone unhappy because as soon as you start keeping books in double entry, you can audit people. You can audit them in real time every single day. This worries all these people who aren't paying taxes because they're worried they might have to start doing it too. Everything is closed down and a pamphlet is written against Necker. And this pamphlet uses numbers. It doesn't just say Necker is a Protestant, Necker is a, a, a radical. No, it uses numbers and it explains in clear, specific numbers why Necker's bad. And the numbers look like they're leaked. Necker goes to Versailles, Marie Antoinette's there. She's a sort of friend of his, but she's wavering. The king's wavering, he's always wavering. And he realizes he's about to fall. So what Necker does is he does a bold move. He publishes this thing that I've shown you, the compte rendu au roi, which is a balance sheet. And at the end of the balance sheet, there's this amazing moment in the history of finance and accounting where he says the revenues exceed uh, 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 expenditures by 10,200,000 pounds. I have a surplus. I have done well. You got to understand, this stuff is printed by hand. A good print run in the 18th century is 2,000 copies, okay? This thing in a year sells more than 100,000 copies in France and tens of thousands of copies across Europe. It becomes the greatest work of finance ever created. And it's a balance sheet. It also has an explanatory part where he explains how the king's brothers take a huge amount of state expenditures for eating. Now, again, you don't, a Protestant does not attack a French prince for eating well. It was a bad move. So and people are f furious at him. But this thing takes off like wildfire. It's a crazy thing. What happens is, and what I would, this is the roots moment of public finance and accounting, where you, know, you hold the baby up to the moon. This is it. This is the baby right here. This is the first time. This compte rendu is followed by another compte rendu, another accounting, which claims that Necker's wrong, that Necker had made an error of 45 million uh, pounds. Necker responds with another one saying, yes, but those were war expenditures. And we all know that we don't count war expenditures as real. Like, again, I mean, <laughs> no wonder France fell apart and had a revolution. Now, so essentially what then follows, it's actually pretty spectacular. This is Necker not giving accounts to the people, but to the king. What happens is Necker is then called Mr. Deficit. And you literally have this arms race, this paper war of accounts. And what happens is, is over the years, literally everyone in government, when they want to make a point, starts publishing their accounts. It becomes the common currency of government. Now, Necker publishes a, new, a number of these. He gets fired. He comes back. On the 12th of July, 1789, a rumor goes out that he's going to be fired again. A couple days later, people get upset and they meet at a really big building in Paris, which no longer stands, it's called the Bastille, and they freak out because they think Necker's gonna be fired, and that means there might be a massacre. The Bastille falls, the revolution starts, Necker comes back, but he's already a man of the past. What stays is this remarkable modern tradition. What I found in the archives are dozens and dozens and dozens of these accounts, which are used as the currency of politics. Um, the French government uh, formula, uh, organizes a bureau of accounting and auditing, costs them a lot of money. At the end of it, they actually publish their accounts. Everyone publishes accounts, from the head of the Navy uh, the, to, the, to the actual assembly itself, to every single government agent, no matter what they do. And this account talks about going out with a cart and, and a cow. No matter how small it is, you have to keep your accounts. It also says to keep your receipts. And at the end, you, you divvy them up, and it's published by the National Assembly. This 
changes the nature of politics completely. And this is the birth of modern financial politics, where you have to keep your accounts. And remember, I think we have to keep our receipts for this conference too, right? You keep your receipts, you show your, uh, you show your accounts, and this more or less becomes how your political uh, 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 legacy is judged. This explodes, and by the 1830s, even the English come to France to understand how they've centralized this system. And in the 1830s, both the French and the English, in tandem, it's hard to believe that they could ever work together in the same system, but sometimes they do, they create something called the budget, which is a, a, a balance sheet based for future ex uh, expenditure and projections. Now, the whole point here, though, is, and I could tell endless stories about this from 1300, 1340, 1648. Accounting comes in, it comes out. We've got a problem with it. It's not stable. So I asked myself a couple questions. If this was the moment that accounting becomes one of the major currencies of politics, do we get less corruption? Well, yeah. France and England and Germany and other countries using these things create modern industry, modern government, massive colonial ventures, but we still get fraud. We still have problems. So the question in this book that I'm writing is what, do we, what, did, it, what did it take to have a functional financial systems that worked in the invention of modern capitalism, capitalism that produced wealth instead of perhaps taking wealth away? Um, what did it take for countries that had financial crises to solve them? And I found some models. And one of the things that worked was having a massively uh, a literate population, a population that knew how to do double entry for their own households, because it doesn't hurt if you have a house to be able to do double entry accounting, because then you don't get in trouble uh, and lose your house. Um, another thing that was happening in France was that since there were no public numbers, people had spies, they had all these different ways to uh, uh, try and understand what companies balance sheets might look like and what the state's balance sheet might look like. One of the things that these early thinkers were trying to think about was what tools could the public have to understand, to basically simulate balance sheets when you're kind of blind. Um, coming here today where people are creating financial tools with technology and using things um, like algorithms and other things, it seemed to me that many of the same problems faced by everyone from the Florentines to the French and the English during these periods, and which remain even after. Remember, most of these numbers were false, okay? One of the things when you live in a world of numbers that are going around, they're often false. But I think the tools that we need, some are really simplistic, like educational reform. People, if they're gonna be homeowners, have to know how to learn accounting. That's called the Italian Middle Ages 101, okay? The second one, though, is how do we judge balance sheets where there are all sorts of hidden risks and, and weird valuations? That's something I think Silicon Valley has the tools to do, which Wall Street, I'm not sure they want to actually see that. I think that's something that would bring transparency and would actually bring us closer to the kind of wealth-creating capitalism that I think most people in this room uh, uh, value. Thank you.